Hey, everyone. My name is Leela Sinha. I'm the founder and director of the Intensives Institute, where we help intensives do their absolute best with their absolute biggest. And today, what we're going to talk about is intensives who are founders who are hiring. Now, before I get started, I do want to say just one thing for intensives who are looking to get hired. Just one thing. Do not take a bad fit position. Don't do it. You will probably undermine yourself more than you realize. And yes, I'm saying this from experience. So there are two possible reasons why you might ignore my advice. One is if you are, um, if it's for survival, absolutely survival first, survival first, survival first. The other is if you're taking a job as a career growth move, if you know you need this job to get into that job and that job's going to be a great fit, but this one's not, that's cool. That's cool. That's fine. Um, however, if you are doing a survival strategy kind of move, if you're doing a career growth strategy kind of move, give yourself a clear exit date and a clear exit plan. Do not move the goalposts and do not be disappointed in yourself if you're not performing at peak because you're not going to, if you're not engaging at peak because you're not going to, if you're not over delivering the way you usually do, that's fine. This is just about getting to the next step. You are borrowing an expansive strategy. And when we borrow expansive strategies, we behave differently, we perform differently. And it's really important for us to cut ourselves slack and understand what's happening in the background in order to allow us to do that borrowing. So give yourself a break, do what you got to do. Absolutely. I'm 100% in favor of you staying alive. However, recognize also the mental toll that it's going to take to take a position that's not a great fit, a much greater mental toll on you than on an expansive. So make sure that if you're doing this, you're doing it for the right reasons, for a limited period of time, and with low expectations for yourself, other than the exact thing you're aiming at. Now, moving on. Thing number two I need to say is this video is primarily aimed at intensives who are hiring teams who already have established organizations. However, if you are an intensive who's hiring like your first person, like you probably think you need to hire a VA, you probably don't need to hire a VA, you probably need to hire someone different. Um, That's a whole other thing I can talk about. But, um, But if you're hiring your first person, Take a look at this video, understand what it's saying, but don't expect all of it to apply to you because I really am talking to people who have larger organizations. And by larger, I don't mean a lot larger. Three people, four people, five people, 20 people, those are all in in the right size range. Um, But you got to start somewhere. You got to hire your first person sometime. And if you're not in a position to hire a whole team right away, if you aren't VC funded, if you aren't Um, angel investor funded, if there's not some kind of money backing you, if you're not your own angel investor, um, you probably can't hire that many people until you get up and running. And so you're probably just looking for a little bit of support. And that is completely legitimate. In fact, intensives have to hire earlier than expansives do. um, Because while we are capable of doing a lot, there are a lot of things that bog us way down way earlier in the process than, um, than an expensive would find. So we end up hiring our first person earlier. But then sometimes because we are kind of jack of all trades types, we can fill in a lot of gaps and use software and our own skill set uh, to get a lot further before we hire the rest of the team. However, When you're ready to hire the rest of the team, hello, people. Hello, intensives. Hello, intensive founders. I am talking to you. So it's time. You've been working your way along, kind of bootstrapping, kind of jury rigging, kind of figuring out how to get things going in your company. Your company is rolling. You've got like enough steady income that you feel like you can reasonably um, hire somebody and pay, you know, pay a whole team and expand. And that's super exciting and a little overwhelming. Or you already have done that, right? You already have an established team and now you're ready to do the next layer of hiring. You're ready to hire a few more people to help the people that you have so that you can move even further into that CEO role, into that visionary role, into that direction setting role and be less and less involved in the kind of nitty gritty and minutia of running your business um, while simultaneously hanging on to the stuff that makes you love your business because otherwise that's not going to be so helpful. So hiring other people, where do you start? 
Number one, always number one, especially if you're an intensive, and I'm going to say that a lot, but I know there are some expansives out there who will be watching this video just to hear what I have to say, which is great. Um, but especially if you're an intensive, know yourself, know yourself, know yourself, know yourself. We are incredibly powerful. We are incredibly charismatic most of the time. And it is critical that we know what our strengths, what our weaknesses are, and what our SEEF types are. So if you have not taken the Sinha Intensive Expansive Framework Assessment, I highly recommend that you do so. You go to intensivesinstitute.com slash assessment and uh, just take that long form assessment um, on that page and it'll email you your score back. You'll get a score from zero to 10 and like a little bit of a primer on what an intensive or an expansive is in case you ended up here without knowing what an intensive or an expansive is. Um, intensives, and very briefly, intensives are people who go like hell and rest like the dead, um, who get really into things or are not into things at all, don't really sit with small talk, are pretty chaos tolerant, are pretty risk tolerant, usually, although that depends on our trauma history, of course, other things can intersect. And expansives, at the other end of the spectrum, are very chill, very mellow, very steady. Um, they don't like surprises. They don't like novelty, particularly expansives um, tend to be very narrow in their emotional expression. So they're excited, but they'll just be like, oh, yay. And they'll be disappointed and they'll be like, oh, that's too bad. Right. And there's not much distance between those two things visually or auditorily. Whereas for an intensive, it's like really big in either direction. So um, think about those two things. If you aren't familiar with the framework, go to intensivesinstitute.com. There are more resources there. Um, know yourself. Know which type you are. Of course, if you're here already, you probably already know you're an intensive. Know your score. Are you a nine, which is almost all the way at the top of the scale? Are you like <laughs> giggling because you're really an 11, but my scale only goes to 10? Are you a six? Are you a seven? Like, where are you in the intensiveness realm? Um, are you right on the line? Like, do you sometimes test as a five and sometimes as a six? Um, figure that out because because who you are and how you are is going to affect how you interact with everyone, just like it's going to affect your people. Are you high or low tolerance? That's the next question. Are you high or low tolerance? So do you work well in expansive environments if you're an intensive? Do you work well with expansives if you're an intensive? Or do you really need things to be intensive around you in order to give your best work? Either one is fine. I'm low intensive. I mean, low, low tolerance. I work very well with intensives, not usually as well with expansives, unless I'm explaining intensiveness to them. Um, but, but it really depends on who you are and how you are. Do you have any linger, lingering squishedness? So um, if you're familiar with my work and my materials, um, my book is called You're Not Too Much. You can find it on Amazon. Um, if you, if you, have read my materials, you'll know that squishedness is squishedness is something that I talk about in terms of taking on the societal message that our intensiveness is wrong. If you are continuing to feel like maybe you're a bad person, maybe you would be better if you just weren't so squished. I mean, if you weren't so intensive, if you're beginning to feel like you would be a better person, if you weren't so intensive, and if you could just get rid of it, that would be better. Um, that's squishedness and that's going to affect you because then you're going to be down on your own intensiveness as well as intensiveness in anyone else. And you're going to feel a combination of like admiration and resentment for expansives. So you want to make sure that you're working on your own embracing of your own intensiveness, especially as you move into leadership. You can't afford to feel crappy about something that's just part of who you are and how you work and part of your brilliance and part of your power, like all of those things come from your intensiveness. So you can't just like, ah, oh, well, I guess I'm going to feel crappy about myself now. <laughs> Next step, once you know yourself, you know whether you're squished, you know whether your tolerance level is high or low. Um, your next question is, your work in general, the kind of work that you do, does it require some measure of tempering? Now, tempering is, again, a concept I talk about in my book. Um, tempering and, and in my intro class, I have a video intro class if you prefer that. Um, tempering is when we kind of pull back a little bit, but we do it intentionally. It's not because I think I'm wrong. It's because I know that if I'm going to accomplish my goal, I need to perform a little bit less intensively um, in the environment where I'm operating in that moment. And then I can just take it off and feel fine about it 
when I leave that environment. So we're not taking on the moral judgment. We're just, you know, making a strategic choice. Again, taking on expansive behaviors as a strategy is something that we can do frequently. So you want to know the kind of work you're doing. Does it require tempering? In order to do that work well, are you working in an environment where everyone else is expansive, for example, um, or where the process is just really slow and detail-oriented? Um, does the work actually just need an expansive? Like, you're not going to hire an intensive. You're going to hire an expansive. That might be your best solution. What is the SEEF type of your company? That's the third question. So the SEEF type of your company, all of our organizations and institutions, collections of people have a SEEF type just like individuals do. So if you have a company, you can kind of sit and, and consider, like, how does your company handle um, rapid change? How does your ha company handle rapid growth? How does your company handle um, steadiness? How does your company handle predictability? Does it sort of lose its energy or does it move forward? And um, this is not necessarily the average of all the people working with you. This is its own thing. It's, it's purely about the essence of your company or the spirit of your company. Is your company intensive or expansive? So, again, does your work require temp tempering? Does it just require an expansive? Does, does this kind of work require expansiveness? Um, what type is your company? Those are really important things to know. In this situation, the trap is going to be hiring an intensive because you feel seen and heard and understood, even though what you needed was an expansive. And the zap the good thing, is hiring an intensive because you need another intensive around here to do stuff you're not doing, or hiring an expansive because you know no intensive is going to do this for more than 10 minutes before they get tired of it. So now we're going to move on to the particular job. This particular job that you're hiring for, does it need an intensive or expansive? Does it need somebody who's super visionary? Does it need somebody who's uh, super organized? Does it need somebody who's super detail oriented? Does it need somebody who's very creative, who's good on their feet, who thinks well in chaos? Do you need an intensive or an expansive? And also consider, especially if you're a, a high level intensive, if you're an intensive who's at the 9, 10 end of the scale, it's possible that what you need is another intensive, but someone who's significantly more expansive than you. So if you're a 9, you might need a 6. Somebody who's more than two numbers separate from you, usually that gap um, indicates that you're going to have a challenge, but it also indicates that you have different skill sets, that you have different strengths, and that can be a real benefit. So consider that it's possible that what you need is an intensive, just not as intensive as you. Um, does this require someone who's high or low tolerance? Are they going to have to interact with clients who are really expensive? Are they going to have to interact with clients who are really intensive? Are they going to have to interact with a lot of like data and numbers and spreadsheets and exacting things or not? Um, does it require tempering? When it interacts with those people, you know, what, what are those people's needs? Do those people need to be treated with um, the particular kind of gentle, like low energy, even tempered expansiveness? Or are the people that they're handling, maybe they do need to be treated with white gloves, but maybe it's a more of a high intensity, like, oh, I'm right on it. I got you. Yes, absolutely, ma'am. Right. So, mm -hmm. So consider what the needs are of the people that they will be interacting with. If this person is going to interact directly with you, I can tell you right now they need to be high, high tolerance um, because they are interacting with you and you're an intensive. That's why you're here. Um, and they're going to need to be very capable of holding that line. Um, so you're going to say, oh my God, I just got this great idea. We're going to go running off in this other direction. And they're going to need to have both the authority and the permission as well as the skill to say, mm, I understand that you're really excited about this and here's what we need to do first. And you're going to need to be able to respect them in that, um, counterbalancing. So make sure it's somebody that you can do that with. The trap in this is believing that you need and can hire someone who is both who is a little bit of a CIF-9 and a little bit of a CIF-2, like really visionary and, and dynamic, but with great organizational skills. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, you might find great organizational skills in an intensive if that's what they turn their intensiveness toward. But you're not going to find someone who's a little bit of a 9 and a little bit of a 2. So if you 
if you think that it's better to have like all the things you need mashed into one job because your one hiring seems better than two hiring, especially if you're dealing with small numbers of hours, let me tell you right now that's not true. The trap is trying to hire one person for that job. The zap is splitting that job into two so you can hire one of each and everyone will be happy. So then you're going to hire a nine for a few hours and a two for a few hours, and they're each going to get to do the thing they're brilliant at, and neither of them is going to be stressed out all the time, low level, just background noise stressed out, because even if they can do the other thing, it's really hard for them to do it. Okay, so we've gotten to the point where we understand the job, we understand the needs, we understand the requirements. It's time to write the description and the application. So first of all, your application form should not be generic ever. There's no, they should just don't. Um, it should cater toward both the job and the CIF type that you're trying to attract. From here on, you are both judging and being judged. You start setting cultural expectations for how your company operates here. So make the job description and application and process appeal to the right kind of person. If you know you're hiring an intensive, Keep in lots of novelty and excitement and sparkle and it, it's okay to surprise them and it's okay to like do something wild a little bit. If you know you're trying to attract an expansive, don't do that. They're just going to feel weird and uncomfortable and then they're not going to want to work for you and they're not going to know why because the job description looks right. What you're looking for for an expansive is an experience that's steady and reliable and predictable with lots of information. You, here's what to expect and then you do exactly what you told them to expect because that makes an expansive feel supported. That makes an expansive feel secure. So you want to make sure that whichever one you're hiring, your hiring process is turned toward that kind of person, that CIF type. So if you're looking for intensives and you get their attention, they start to, you know, who's, who's hiring, who's interested, and you get their attention, you've got to keep them engaged with novelty, with, um, you know, even automated emails, but automated emails um, that make them feel like, like they should stay around, like they should stay involved through the process. And of course, you want the process to be as fast and streamlined as possible. That's just, that's just kinder to everybody, no matter what kind of person you're engaging. If you're hiring an expansive, give them lots and lots of information about the process, what to expect. Give them time and space to digest it slowly. Give them checklists. Give them spreadsheets. Give them things that make it feel like everything is planned and everything is organized. This might be really hard. You might actually have to hire a contractor um, just quickly to help you create that experience. Um, or you can hire me to consult. I'll give you a little more information about that at the end. Um, but you really want to make sure that you're creating this nurturing, safe environment for an expansive and this stimulating, engaging environment for an intensive. Do not lie about who you are. Like, don't lie about your company. Don't lie about yourself. Um, but do make it welcoming for the people that you want while simultaneously not lying about who you are. And benefits should follow types too. So as you're thinking about, you know, what kind of benefits you're going to give this person, even if they're part-time, intensives like a lot of flexibility, expansives like a lot of rhythm and a lot of um, routine. So you're going to want to have a conversation with them or just think ahead. And when you're thinking about what kinds of things to offer them, make sure you're offering them things that are appropriate to their CIF type. Because, um, you know, and, and there are some variations. Intensives who have to be out at three to pick up their kid will have to have a regular schedule of being out at three to pick up their kid. But, but intensives and expansives both are going to give you better work if they're in a better supported environment. And so um, you're going to want to think about like what kinds of things will keep an intensive engaged? What kinds of projects will keep an intensive engaged? What kinds of things will keep an expansive um, feeling steady and, and at ease so that they can do their best work? Because you really want out of whoever you hire, you really want their best work um, in as little stress as possible. So the trap here is pretending some, you're someone you're not or setting up a process that encourages applicants to pretend that they're someone they're not. So you want to make sure that you're clear about who you're looking for, but that you're never shaming someone for not being that person. You want to make sure that your process is like, this is who we would love to see. These are the qualifications we would love to see. These are the qualifications that are like, you know, they're nice to have. We don't absolutely have to have them. 
Um, the more clear you are and the more consistent you are, no matter who you're selling to, um, cause you're selling yourself, right? No matter who you're, you're selling, presenting yourself and this position to, um, the more clear and consistent you are about what you say about what you're offering, the better off you'll be. The Zap is setting up a process and atmosphere that encourages people to be honest about what environments and supports they need. Everybody knows, oh, I work better in silence. Oh, I work better with music. Oh, I work better when people can just drop in and talk to me. Oh, I work better when I'm completely undisturbed. You know, encourage people to be honest about what they need. Make it clear that there's some flexibility in your company about meeting those needs. And then you can seriously consider as part of the process, you can seriously consider whether you can include, include those as part of shaping the role. If you're going to need them to be like right on with something, tell them that. If you're going to have a lot of space for them to kind of create their own structure, their own role, tell them that. Um, and if you need them to be responsive to your own intensiveness, tell them that and tell them, um, especially if you're working with an expansive, you want to make sure you set a container around the chaos as much as possible. Like if you need to brain dump to your person periodically, you can um, let them know that like, okay, every Wednesday morning, we're going to have a brain dump meeting. So don't, I'm not expecting you to like come to the meeting and take notes. We're going to record it. I'm going to make sure you get the transcript afterwards. And what I want you to do is um, be a sounding board for me so that my best ideas can come out because I'm a verbal processor, which is very different from, oh, I had these six ideas and we're going to execute them all, which is where an expansive goes with a brain dump if they don't have other information. They're like, oh no, I have to keep track of all this and I have to make all of this happen. And how is that going to work? It, it, it's not, and that's fine. It's actually fine. But you need to tell them that. Okay, so you put out the job description, you put out the application. The application makes as much sense as it can. And, you know, job applications are always a little weird, but it asks questions that are relevant. It doesn't ask questions that are not relevant. Um, it invites people to tell their story in such a way that, um, that they can fill in the blanks. This is especially important if you're trying to hire an intensive. If you're trying to hire an expansive, um, what you want to do instead is um, give them a lot of structure, give them a lot of clear questions, bullet points, lists, how many of this do you want? That kind of stuff will really help an expansive um, move through the process. An intensive will probably give you less predictable information unless they have really clear instructions. So if you need something really predictable, if you need like your last three employers, ask for it, your last three employers. But if you don't need that, don't ask for it. Ask for the stuff that you really need that's really going to help you make the right decision and that's going to help them make the right decision. Now, the interview. When you go into an interview, at that point, you're really discerning for fit. You want to see if this person is going to be able to do the job. You want to see if this person is going to be, you want to, you want to explore together, find out whether this role has enough in common with this person and this person has enough in common with this role that you want them in that role, that they'll be able to meet your needs in that role. And it might be that the job shifts a little bit if you find someone who's really brilliant um, but doesn't have like a little of this or a little of that. You might be able to think of ways that you can shift the position, even, um, even in the process of the interview and, and selection process. So um, have some questions that will help you determine what the person's strengths are and whether they'll match the role. Um, and you can ease back a little on sieve type. You may have had them take the assessment. Um, do not, do not, do not, do not use the assessment um, as a gatekeeping tool. Don't have them take the assessment first um, and then and then decide who you're going to interview based on their assessment scores. The assessment is a very coarse tool. Instead, you want to use it as a way of exploring how this person might work, how this person might fit in with your institution, or how they might not, um, or what they might be able to do that you hadn't imagined. So don't use it as a gatekeeping tool. Use it as information as you're going into the, into the interview. Um, you, you're probably going to um, be tempted to say, oh, well, you're an expansive, so I don't really want to consider this candidate, but don't do it. If they made it as far as the interview, if they made it past the application process and all of that, there's something you liked about them. So keep them in the queue and see what you need to do. Um, see what they have. See why it is that you were really attracted to them or they were really attracted to you or both. Um, at this point, type is less important than actual fit. Type is a tool. And you hit this point where like their type is less important 
um, to their ability to do the job than their actual ability to do the job. Know what qualities you would have to see in, say, an expansive to hire them for a role that you think you want an intensive for or vice versa. Know, oh, yeah, well, the reason I think this is an intensive role is because they have to do a lot of um, management of kind of chaotic situations. So if somebody does great in chaotic situations, even though they're an expansive, um, then maybe I would hire them anyway, because it would be awesome to have somebody in this role who's really good at organization for a variety of other reasons, and that's something we usually find in expansives. No game playing, no gotchas. I shouldn't even have to say this, but somehow we still live in a world where this is something that needs to be said. Be kind. This is not an adversarial process. This is not like you jockeying with them. This is not about how much work you can get for how little money. This is not about um, how you can force someone to like live up to their potential. Y you are in an intensive. You understand people in intuitively, usually. You can be shrewd. You can be mean. Don't do it. You don't need to. You don't need to. It doesn't get you better employees. It doesn't build a better company culture. And if you establish that at the interview, you're stuck with it. Don't do it. Be nice. Be kind. Watch for hesitations that are consistent with one type or another. So if you're not sure if this person is true to type or if they're um, if they're if you're kind of considering them across type or if you're not sure for some reason what their type is, maybe they like... Maybe they came back with a high SIEF score, but a low um, reliability score. Um, watch for hesitations that are consistent with one type or another. So are they really visionary? Do they get really excited about new creative ideas? Are they very planful? Do they say, oh, well, yeah, I, um, I have 16 spreadsheets and that's how I run my life. Are they really steady? Do they get inspired really easily? Do they like go down a rabbit hole with you for 15 minutes? <laughs> know what you need and keep that in mind one way or the other. Of course, if you like them and they're not a fit, tell them as soon as possible, but also keep their name on file. And if they're amazing, super consider creating a role for them. You're an intensive founder. That is something you're really good at, and you don't want to let go of somebody who would be great in your company. Just make sure that it's they would be great in your company and not you just really enjoyed talking to an intensive, and that's why the interview went three hours. Do not give anyone a final decision until you sleep on it. Intensives, we love, love, love to make our gut decisions. And you probably will have made a gut decision by the time you wrap your last interview. But don't give anyone a decision until you've slept on it. Like, go from your gut. If you meet with somebody who's absolutely perfect and you can't imagine a better candidate, um, then cancel the rest of your interviews and then hire them. Um, because because what you want to do is make sure that you're deeply in integrity through this whole process, or you're going to feel crappy about it every time you look at this person, and that's not a great way to go to work. The trap is loving the way you click with the other person so much that you forget what you're hiring for and you hire the wrong person. And this app is finding someone you feel good about who also has all the qualities you need. And that Sometimes we'll take two rounds. Sometimes we'll take, you know, creative readjustment of the, of the materials, of the job description and the posting and the application materials. But make sure that you do the work that you need for a good fit. The same way I said at the very beginning that intensives looking for jobs shouldn't accept a bad fit except for a very narrow range of strategic reasons, you should not accept a bad fit either. It's better to hobble along for another two months and redo your search than it is to end up with the wrong person in your company. Getting the wrong person out of a company when it's early stages and when they're very embedded is really hard, um, and and you don't want to have to do it. So um, so and of course you still have to accept the 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 risk that perhaps something will go wrong, perhaps, <laughs> but we don't want to encourage it to go wrong. Um, so if you meet with everybody and you don't find a fit, try again, redesign things, tweak things. Um, again, you can hire me to consult if you've gone through one search and it's failed. That's a great time to bring me in if you didn't bring me in initially. Um, and we can figure out what you need to do to make your job posting and your work um, more appealing to the right people. If you go through it twice and you're still having trouble, it might be you. Um, and that's when it's a great time to do a one-on-one -on -one consult with me or to, or just to go to your therapist and talk to your therapist about it. See if there's stuff under there that's keeping you from 
letting go of control, keeping you from um, engaging in a collaborative process with someone else, you know, what's figuring out what's going on. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about onboarding, even though that's not technically part of the hiring process, because it's so critical. Um, Again, you want to tailor the onboarding to, you, to the type. You want to give expansives lots of room to adjust and lots of paperwork to read at home to get them up to speed. You want to give them formal meetings and get-togethers to meet the team. You want to be really clear about the expectations, especially at the beginning. Don't give them a lot of wiggle room. Just be like, okay, so, so we're just going to start you out here and here and here, and then set up a meeting at which you're going to exchange feedback after the first couple of weeks. Um, not very long, just long enough for them to have felt what works and what doesn't work to get to know some people. Um, expansives are less likely to give you feedback spontaneously, so you want to make sure you create structures for that. They're less likely um, to go outside the what they understand to be the expectation. So make sure you set up whatever you need from them as an expectation and create a space for it. Intensives need enough meaty intrigue to get them engaged and keep them excited, especially if there's any kind of lag between the interview and the onboarding. Lots of learn-as-you-go, hands-on, engaged kinds of learning is great. Um, not a lot of consequences for mistakes. If you teach them that they can't make mistakes, they won't take risks. And if they don't take risks, they're not going to bring their best. So make sure that there's a, a buffer system. You know, If they're going to make mistakes, but they can't send them live to the client, for example, um, then make sure that their deadlines are like a week before the client deadline so that they can share with you and... Um, and really give themselves the space to, um, to, to make that mistake and then still have recovery time. Let them meet and chat with people in their own way, but make the opportunities easy for them. Um, create spaces where they can interact or where they can bump into people or where they can just spontaneously message people. Um, send out some bios. This is probably good for everybody. Send out some bios so everybody kind of has some place to start. Sometimes it's really hard to start a conversation, especially if you're an intensive and you don't know if the other people will have anything in common with you. Um, the audit for an onboarding process, auditing an onboarding process probably takes only like an hour um, when we are auditing just for sieve type, but it can make a huge difference in the in the arrival experience and in the um, the attitude that people have, the experience, the initial experience that people have, the first impression they have of your organization. So um, absolutely, I can be hired for that as well. Um, and then they're there, and then they're on your team, and then you can start to hand stuff over to them, um, and then you might need to work on handing stuff over to them. I know I always have trouble letting go of stuff, but when I do, it's such a relief. When I just hand it to someone else, and I'm like, this is your job. I don't have to think about it anymore. So um, just briefly, thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for sticking around this long, um, and thank you for wanting to hire well. It's so important to hire well, and um, and I think it's a process that often gets badly neglected. Getting the candidates in the door um, is something that, you know, there's an entire recruiting industry out there for it. But once the candidates are in the door, are you really handling it well? Are you really making sure you're bringing in the right candidates? Are you really going through the process in a way that's supportive for them? Um, so thank you. Thank you for considering all of that in addition to all of the everything else that runs your company. If you want to hire me, um, I have a package on my website, which I'll put the link in the comments. Um, it's a five session package. We do, um, we do a, a getting to know you. I need to know your company. If I already know your company, we might be able to skip that one. Um, job description development, interview, onboarding, and then a post onboarding, like settling in, a review after about a month or six weeks. How's it going? Is there anything that you feel like needs to be tweaked or that's weird and you're wondering how you could how you could address it? Um, that's something I can help you with too. So that package is available on my website. Um, totally check it out if you uh, would like some support with with CEF hiring. Um, CEF smart hiring just makes things so much better for everybody and it improves your odds of having the right candidate so dramatically. Um, that I would really encourage you to um, consider all of this, go back over it, actually work through the questions and the process, because I know you probably watched this while doing something else uh, or listened to it while doing something else. And once you're through it, um, really see, see how that affects things. You know, you're, you're going you're, you're gonna to encounter a different 
perspective on your hiring process when you do this. It's a different way of approaching hiring, and it really leans in the direction of of holistic hiring, of a kind of whole person hiring rather than just hiring for the particular skill set you think you need. And I think that's where hiring is going, and I'm so glad you're on board with me. I'll talk to you soon.